It's great to have back on the program Philippe Asuline. He is an international relations expert. And much like I was, I'm sure, Philippe, you were very interested in yesterday's speech by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The speech happening under somewhat controversial circumstances, quite a bit of back and forth for the speech. And he also has uh, an election coming up in Israel. So first, what, is, what was your reaction to the speech? So hi, David, thank you for having me. Uh, my reaction is a bit uh, what like you were hinting to. There was a lot of politicization of this speech, a lot of controversy, which could be very costly for Israel. And even though the message, I think, is, is uh, worthwhile, I think it's, it's true that Iran presents a real threat. Personally, I didn't think the speech was at the level given the controversy that was... Uh, that preceded it. So as I was watching the speech, I found myself reacting in a way where I said, you know, I'm agreeing with 75 percent of the facts that are being presented here. Uh, I agree with most of what's being said about Iran. I agree that uh, uh, Jews have been, um, uh, you know, harassed, expulsed and mistreated for thousands of years and that there there are not that many places where Jews really have a place that they can feel that they are going to be safe. And even then in Israel, Jews are not always safe. But then I found myself saying, you know, some of the things that Benjamin Net Netanyahu is saying here don't strike me as accurate. And I'll tell you what a couple of them are and, and we can kind of discuss them. One is that there are leaked cables which which con contradict what Benjamin Netanyahu said about Iran and nuclear weapons. The Mossad's own leaked cables seem to suggest some of what he said was not accurate. And also he gave this impression that ISIS and Iran are working together to some extent. But we have a lot of evidence suggesting that that's not true either. So comment on that. Do you think his case was weakened by that? Um, yes and no. I mean, there's there's nuances to, to both valid points you raised. Um, on the first one, the Mossad cables, the, the difference there is of, of a time frame, how long it would take or how advanced Iran is to getting a nuclear weapon. I think there was a misunderstanding that the Mossad said they weren't seeking nuclear weapons. I think they were saying they weren't seeking nuclear weapons right now, but the whole program is still moving forward. Uh, with respect to ISIS, uh, there has been a cooperation between Iran and Sunni groups. But it's not at the level that is perhaps suggested in some of the punditry that all Islamism is the same thing. Um, Assad in Syria, without getting too bogged down in the details, Assad, uh, the dictator in Syria, who is basically a client of Iran, has been supporting ISIS precisely to look as a moderate force. But I think you're right that Benjamin Netanyahu's message gets lost sometimes because of some of the hyperbole. And the, uh, what I would have wanted him to focus more on is explaining why the threat of Iran to Israel, which is greater than the threat to America, uh, is sufficient, and the threat of America to America itself are sufficient to justify a tougher stance on Iran, or a different approach on Iran. I don't think he did that sufficiently. He was, like you're saying, going to um, perhaps more alarmist statements. Well, the, the speech, as are most of Netanyahu's speeches, was delivered incredibly well. He is his, his rhetoric is particularly given that while he, he essentially speaks English as his native language, uh, it, it is not actually his native language. He's in, in Congress in another country, an allied country, albeit the ability that he has for public speaking is is quite amazing. It's something to be reckoned with. But at the same time, I remind myself of that when I say to myself, he is very coyly positioning himself as the authority figure, the authority candidate for the upcoming election that he has, because the, the threat from Iran, whatever you consider it to be, has not drastically changed over the last couple of months. So I question the timing as mere political uh, uh, opportunism. So I think that's an extremely valid point, and I think that's the main point of contention in Israel itself. Um, the idea, like you said, the last couple of months is the real question here now. Whether Iran is advancing towards a bomb, I don't think many people question, but to have it presented as if this is the moment of truth and at the same time call elections that many thought were not necessary is something that weakened his message both here and in Israel. Um, and he has been ringing the alarm bells on Iran for a very long time and, it's, and I was expecting because of that to see something very different in the speech. But unfortunately, he wasn't there. I think essentially he ended up making his case or trying to make his case to the American public. Uh, what the utility of that is, I don't know. But in Israel, people interpret it overwhelmingly the way you do. 
I would love to have your thoughts about Benjamin Netanyahu's potential uh, to be a, a broker of real peace in Israel. For several years, I've been saying that aside from whatever it is that he would personally want to see happen, and people can disagree about how how progressive or conservative or reactionary Benjamin Netanyahu is. He has shown to me that because of the involvement of extreme religious right wing elements in Israel that are necessary for him to build a coalition, he is not really going to be able to get around their desires to be a, a legitimate broker of peace. And I would like to see someone else who at least has not yet been discredited in my mind as a potential real broker of peace come forward. I don't question his ability to broker peace. What I question is, given the 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 involvement and the extremist religious elements that are tied in with him, whether he could even really put something forward like that. Um, again, a very interesting point, and there's a lot of discussion to be had there. I think again, this is the problem with that I see with a lot of what Netanyahu does. Israel does face very real dangers that are legitimate obstacles to withdrawing from land now under the current conditions. Of course. How However, because of how he manages to politicize everything, that gets lost and it becomes about him and his coalition. On the one hand, in the 90s, Netanyahu, when he was prime minister, ended up ceding more land to the Palestinians than any other prime minister under Oslo. On the other hand, you're absolutely right, right now with the makeup of the coalition. And also, I have to say, the feelings of the Israeli public, um, he will probably be paralyzed. And the problem with Netanyahu is that he kind of feels comfortable in that paralysis instead of presenting an alternate vision, which actually I commend the right wing, the, the, the hard right that you're talking about, for at least they present a vision, one I don't agree with, but they present a vision and the left presents a vision. Netanyahu kind of talks out of both sides of his mouth on this and he tries to maintain the status quo without saying it. And that's the real problem. Uh, if I could just add about peace, the, the point I'm trying to make that things become politicized, yeah. it's become about him instead of the fact that Israelis are terrified of withdrawing from more land and getting rockets on a much bigger and more dangerous scale. They withdrew from Gaza unilaterally, and what they got is basically an intolerable situation where Hamas took over, and every time Hamas has problems in its own relations with the Arab world or its finances or anything like that, it starts to rain rockets on Israeli cities, not bases, cities. So Israelis are terrified. Now, Netanyahu has not really been able to make that case because it always comes back to him. And I agree with you, he's making moves because of coalition concerns that detract from the message. Last thing I want to touch on is who do you think, in terms of this upcoming election in Israel, really gives us the best chance at a more progressive voice that might be able to, to further real peace talks? Um, I, so first of all, I'm not sure that the ability to reignite peace talks is entirely in the hands of Israel. But to the extent that Israelis can do something to improve the situation, I don't think any one candidate could do it. I actually believe that um, the mix of Naftali Bennett from the hard right and Yair Lapid, who is center left, when they were working closely together in this last Knesset, passed a lot of progressive legislation. And they are able between themselves to compromise. There's another centrist party now that has Michael Oren in it, the former uh, Israeli ambassador to the U.S., which would also be able to give, I think, Israelis a sense of confidence that this was not some adventurous, risky peace policy, but yet open up to the Palestinians and reach some kind of a, a discourse. The best politician now to help in terms of the relationship with the Palestinians is, I think, Ruby Rivlin, who is the president and actually is in a ceremonial post. But he's been doing amazing work reaching out to the Arab public in Israel. And last question on this. If we get to the point of real peace negotiations, do you see a dynamic that might be better served by negotiations directly with uh, Gaza authorities, or would you see a sort of three-way negotiation that brings in the West Bank as one that may be more productive? I'll go one step further. I think what Israel should be uh, uh, seizing now is the opportunity to make peace with the entire Arab world. The silver lining to Iran becoming a threat to the region, and a very real threat, is that the Arab states are terrified and they look to Israel as an ally in this fight, and they've shown signs that they're more willing to negotiate. A peace with all the Arab states or a majority of the Arab states 
would be able to rein in much better the threats presented, legitimate threats presented by Hamas and even Fatah, because those are weak regimes and unstable. And I think Israel should be looking towards some kind of framework agreement with the Arab world. And that would also provide President Obama with an alternate legacy, if you believe that argument, that that's what he's interested in, and something that is perhaps more enduring in the Middle East. And that's where I would, that's the angle I would follow. All right. We will definitely follow up with you after the election. We've been speaking with Philippe Asouline, international relations expert. Always great to talk to you. Thank you for having me, David.